Hi everyone, uh, we're back live again uh, at the uh, Rutgers NJIT kind of combined uh, thing that we've got uh, going on here. Uh, quickly uh, retweet a couple of things over here. But if you want to be able to follow along with everything, uh, follow the uh, SciComm Monday account. Uh, follow with the Rutgers NJIT SciComm hashtag. Everything we do will uh, be under that hashtag today. And then if you also uh, have any further questions, uh, feel free to uh, tweet me at my personal handle as well. So we're uh, live here um, with uh, Tony Cullen and he does a lot of invasive species plant stuff. So um, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your background with things to let people sure. know like how'd you get to where you are now? <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm a non-traditional student. You might be able to tell by the gray in my beard, but um, I actually started off, um, I kind of did my, my academics in pieces. I, I worked for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for about 12 years, and I, I was kind of a jack of all trades. I did public outreach, um, so talking to school groups and such. I did maintenance work, I did biology work, and really what drew me back into academics was um, I helped graduate students out with their project at the refuge, and um, so I got to do all sorts of cool work. I got to do turtle work and bat work uh, before uh, white nose was a thing when it was first appearing on the scene, and before so I got it to devastated everything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, before it devastated everything, um, and so and and uh, the list goes on. So um, through through working with those projects, I knew that I wanted to go to graduate school. And um, so once I finished my undergrad degree, um, I, I started applying to programs. And uh, I found myself here at Rutgers Nork, uh, which is, it's a joint program. That's why it's NGIT and, and, and Rutgers, uh, which is great. Which I learned this week. I didn't know. I was uh, just assuming it was Rutgers. I was like, oh, no, we're actually part of this. I'm like, oh, that's really neat. Like, it's always interesting, like, when universities can combine together yeah. and, like, help each other out. So it's, it's a cool. And not all departments are combined, but uh, the biology department happens to be uh, federated, which is nice because you get basically double the amount of professors to, mm -hmm. to to play off of. Um, anyway, but back to me. Um, anyway, so the last five years now, um, I've been doing work on invasive plant species. I'm a, I'm a plant community ecologist. That's my thing. And um, let's see. And and so that's where I'm at now. I'm hoping to, to finish up soon in the next uh, year or so. So. Right. Yeah, on the tail end of things. <laughs> so why don't you, uh, just for everyone out there, if you have any questions, um, feel free to uh, send them in. This is more of a, an ask me anything uh, kind of format. So any questions you have, uh, shoot them in and we'll do our best to uh, answer them. Uh, so yeah, tell us a little bit about the species that you work with, with plants and you know how they're invasive and how they're invading across uh, the region. Sure, so what's really neat about my study and, and uh, like, any good study, sometimes you just stumble upon it. Uh, I was just, I'm, since I do mostly uh, forest ecology and I look at the understory, I just happened to notice uh, a, sh a shrub one day and I asked the park biologist, like, what, what is that? And he, he happened to tell me. And so I looked into it more and I realized there's um, two viburnum species that are currently kind of invading in, in the Northeast, mostly in So New what is viburnum, just for everyone yeah. out there who doesn't know, and me who doesn't know? Yeah, of course, no, that's an excellent question. Yeah. Sometimes you get too jargony. Yeah, yeah. so viburnum is um, mostly an understory shrub. There are native species here in the U.S. Uh, there's about three that I can think of off the top of my head that are native to New Jersey. Um, these two happen to be from um, East Asia. Uh, one is from like China and Korea and Japan. The one is... Um, solely from Japan. Um, and so uh, these species made their way over as horticultural specimens. They're planted because they're very pretty. They have showy. It's always what it is. That's yeah. what it is with my uh, species. I study invasive mute swan, and it's they were brought over because yeah. they're pretty. They're which pretty. They, are. they have right, very we'll totally showy flowers that, so. and um, very beautiful berries that birds love, which is part of the reason they're able to spread so well. All right. um, and But they're the luck in this came that they just they, they just happen to be new new invaders. They've been here for about 150 years in gardens, but just in the past um, 20 or 30 years, that doesn't that sounds like a long time, but in, in invasion time, it's actually not that long. They started invading, and they're now found in um, New York State and Pennsylvania, as well as New Jersey and a, a couple other Midwestern states as well. But they, they haven't they're not widespread, which makes them actually ideal to study. And, and what I'm looking at really is how they disperse. Um, I'm inter interested in propagule pressure, so how much seeds they're producing, and then how that seed is spreading, um, and looking at um, what's dispersing it, what the 
what the patterns of dispersal look like, and um, also um, how related are the populations to one another to get an idea of how they're kind of spreading. So um, where is it like that you do your work around here? Like where like in New Jersey or outside of New Jersey or is, is your work focused? Sure. Well, originally I started off in central Jersey at a uh, Morristown National Historic Park. And there's several parks around there. It's actually a nice area. There's um, Great Swamp National Wildlife Refuge. There's uh, an Autobond. Uh, there's a c couple county parks. So there's kind of this contiguous land in the middle of central Jersey. And um, so that's where I started. That's where I first found them. But um, since I really got into it in the last like two or three years, uh, my studies expanded to New York City, uh, a lot of the parks around there, uh, uh, Queens, Bronx, also uh, Philadelphia area. So um, down near, uh, I have a site at Bryn Mawr College in, in Philadelphia. And um, I've also been going around to Arboretums because since they're uh, horticultural species, I want to compare the native populations to uh, the cultivated populations oh, that that's exist. that's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, just to give everyone a quick glimpse of how close we are to some of those locations, if you look there, I don't know how yeah. low it's going to focus in. New York in. City's right if there. If I zoom in, if you see yeah. those really tall buildings right back there, that's New York City right mm -hmm, there. Southern Manhattan. Yeah. <laughs> Things about being in a location like this is you can have access to some of those really uh, uh, close facility like because how long does it take you to get to Philadelphia not like, maybe, long does it even Philadelphia day, is probably like a half day? yeah it's it's like um, an hour and a half oh, um, that's, and that's, that's not even yeah, yeah I was thinking it was so much further that's not, that's not bad at all and I have colleagues uh, down there so I can stay for a day or two I don't have to turn around and come right back yeah so it's nice um, my field sites are closed and it's nice because um you know our, my lab does a lot of urban ecology, which I also is a love of mine, and so you kind of get to combine it because uh, these shrubs are indiscriminate. I mean, they're mo they mostly like forest understory, but okay. even just a little path somewhere in the city, they, they could be found and, and have been. So Yeah, that's, that's one of the interesting things I, I think isn't studied a lot of, or at least we don't hear about it a lot, is how animals and species are in cities. Like I really liked uh, Planet Earth this uh, too with the past one, they actually did an episode just on city animals. Mm -hmm. And it's like, we need to talk about that more because so many times when we go out and talk about science, I think we just talk about, you know, those pristine habitats and where those animals are. It's neat to be able to see like how they actually interact with yeah. us in a city. And well, yeah, and I mean, you know, as an urban ecologist, we're aware, you know, we, we listen to the statistics where we hear like, 50% of people in the US, uh, in the world now live in cities and by 2030 it'll be 60% and here in the northeast where I am it's more like 80% live in and around cities oh, wow. and so urban ecology I mean people have started to recognize and have recognized for a while that it's the next kind of front we need to start paying mm -hmm. more attention to to these habitats because they are their habitats you know yeah because uh, driving in from uh, where I was staying because I was uh, staying with uh, Kathleen Furley the PhD student that's hosting me um, driving from her home into the campus here, we were going through different towns, but there was no break at all. It was just no. like, like you couldn't tell where one town ended and another began. And so yep. animals Urban and sprawl. species are living <laughs> here. And so yeah. it is like, you have to study it because it's, it's not necessarily that you have a giant forest right here. And so you got to see what's happening and that's really neat. So yeah, I can see that becoming like one of those next steps of ecology. Oh, yeah. And like any, uh, well, not any major <laughs> metropolitan city, but um, like say Chicago, New York and, and New Jersey, like they have like wild coyote populations, mm -hmm. like in some of these patches. And, you know, they like, even just the park by me supports, you know, skunk and fox and all sorts. So, I mean, there, there's just, there, it's, yeah, it's, there's bountiful uh, studies to be done that people haven't done yet. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so, with invading, like you said, you're thinking about like you know the birds might be eating the berries and moving uh, your uh, plants along. Like, how is it like most plants you know get moving along with the invasions like that? Like, is that a very common way for plants to uh, be invading new environments? Well, yeah. So I mean, with plants, it's 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 not actually complex necessarily, but it depends on 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 what it is. Like whether it's you know, herbaceous, is it dying back every year? Is it a shrub or a tree? In my case, they happen to be shrubs. Um, and, and, and because they were ornamentals, they happen to have nice berries that frugivorous birds would, would enjoy. Mm -hmm. um, and so in my case, um, 
it's 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 probably uh, either avian or mammal dispersed. Um, but in other cases, it could be wind. Um, you know, it could be a lot of different mechanisms. Out west, it could be fire. Um, but but yeah, in my case, it's it's birds mostly because they really show a beautiful fruit. Uh, one of the shrubs has very red berry, which is attractive to birds, and the other one is like a deep blue and purple. And so, kind of the question is is because um, I, I noticed the disparity in the feeding times and when things were being eaten and so it's like well uh, one of the shrubs all the berries were disappearing during fall migration and so the first thing you think of is like well then they have a chance to be dispersed further and mm -hmm. maybe spread into more states um, where uh, the other fruit um, is only eaten like in the winter after a big snowstorm when resources are kind of slim and those birds probably aren't moving. And they're not probably around. moving okay. it that far. And so yeah. it becomes this, to me anyway, an interesting idea of, of plants having strategies. Mm -hmm. um, most people roll their eyes, but as a plant ecologist, plants do have traits that lead to certain strategies. Um, and so that's, that's the interesting question from a theoretical point of, of view, but also because I, I worked for um, a government agency that's mostly does land management for so long. I also have an applied angle, uh, invasive of interest to me because a lot of national parks and refuges and, and any any park really is struggles with uh, invasions, whether it be you know fish or bird or or plant. Um, so it's a really big issue. Uh, do you find with it being an ornamental and a you know, plant that people like, do you have a harder time convincing them that their beloved backyard plant is an actual invasive species. Because I, I know I have that issue <laughs> with my invasive mute swans. Yeah. People love them and they, one, like because you were saying that the plants have been around for so long here, like a lot of people don't understand that mute yeah. swans are invasive because they've been here for so yep. long. And so do you, are you running into the issues of one, do they understand it's invasive, you know, just and then even if they do understand it, do yeah. they not care because it's their pretty plant? So. It, it, it depends. So like we had, um, we're, the refuge that I worked at, we had mute swans as well. And yeah, any any kind of um, animal or plant that is any the least bit charismatic, you have more trouble convincing people. Mm -hmm. um, with with the things that are thorny and nasty, people and they're invasive as well. People are like get rid of them. <laughs> Um, with some of the ones that are ornamental and beautiful, it, it's somewhat of a struggle, but I think people, the more outreach I've done, I think people understand that like it's a, it's a real issue, and even if they're uh, appealing, that there's something has to be done. And so most people are, are gung-ho, and, and some people just don't care, so you've you got a little leeway on either right. side. Yeah. So. Oh. So if you've got any questions, uh, make sure you uh, send them in because uh, we definitely want to make this as engaging a platform as possible. So if you've got questions about invasive plants, fire away or studying, you know, urban uh, ecology because that is interesting because I, I know where I am in uh, Michigan that yes, there is some urban areas, but a lot of it still is that green space. And so we don't mm -hmm. do a lot of uh, urban studies of things, but there are a lot of uh, interesting uh, thanks. Uh, we have a question coming in. Is bamboo invasive? Well, I guess that depends on where It depends where on where you, you are. are. Yeah, but so. in the U.S., definitely. Yeah, and it's really invasive. Um, it's very hard to control once it's spread um, because it, it, it grows under the ground. And so even if you treat what's above ground, it has this really thick, matted root system um, that makes it pretty difficult. It's great. A lot of people use it for uh, screens, you know, in their yard so they can keep out their neighbors or whatever. Uh, so in that sense, it's really nice, um, but but yeah, at least in the U.S., um, it's invasive. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, we're uh, talking here live from Rutgers slash uh, New Jersey Institute of Technology. I keep wanting to say NGIT, and I'm so afraid I'm going to mess up the acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to happen Rutgers at some point NGIT, in time. Yeah, that's okay. So yeah, we're talking uh, with Tony Cullen. He's a PhD student uh, here at Rutgers. and. So any questions you have about uh, his research uh, with invasive plants in the uh, greater metropolitan area here of New Jersey or just life as a PhD student, uh, sure. feel free to uh, send those in. Um, so yeah, like how often do plants from people's backyards end up going into the environment and thus become a problem? Because I think that's one of the things like we all see these really beautiful plants and we bring them in and we don't necessarily realize that you could be spreading, you know, yeah. while that pretty flower might look 
gorgeous, all of a sudden it's like everywhere. So like how often does that kind of like really happen in invasive species yeah. invasions? Yeah, things, well so. luckily like I don't have to be a killjoy on this question because I mean it, it actually, um, I mean there's this this rule, there's this paper out there that says about 10% and, and that's not, you know, that there's been some debate about whether that 10% rule or, or holds true. So if you have 100 species, you know, 10 would maybe be invasive. You know, it's a it's a it's a good talking point. Um, how how whether the scientific merit is is true. It, you know, there's probably more that needs to be done on that. But so not everything. There's some things that have been here for years and never go beyond the borders of their garden. There's other things that um, that do, and it's um, scientists and, and biologists have really had a hard time. I mean, the biggest question invasive is like what traits what traits make something invasive and unfortunately I mean it just it depends on where it's found and what that plant's adapted to uh, whether it'll invade or not it depends on that the habitat and how disturbed the habitat is. I mean there's it's almost the factors around the plant uh, that dictate sometimes more so than than the plant you know okay. there has to be resources available so um, so not too many thankfully um, you know, we don't have to be worried about. But it is good to plant native when you when you can. I mean, uh, even if you don't like plants and they're they're not your favorite, you might like bees or birds. Mm -hmm. And um, if you plant native stuff that pollinators in that area are used to, uh, or bird species are used to, it's, it's gonna you're gonna have a more vibrant yard or community um, than if you plant in, invasives. Um, so. so you plant a native species. In theory, you're going to have more insects, which could lead to a bigger diversity of birds. So if you like watching birds in your backyard, you want more birds. Exactly, to be plants able to add are to your the cows. base level. Yeah. I know I'm not, you know, I, as I'm like the lone plant ecologist, but um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's the base level, right? Primary producers. Mm -hmm. So they whatever you do, you know, builds off, everything else builds off of. Um, so, so uh, I guess this might be more towards like the gardening side of things. But what are some good plants that people could plant in their backyards around the greater New Jersey area that might be better than say the shrubs that you study. Yeah, well, so there are there's um, several native viburnums. Um, there's um, uh, I, I don't want to use the Latin name because nobody has this like <laughs> have fun um, remembering what that yeah, is. Yeah, I was like, it oh, it's viburnum dentatum, and then I was like, oh, that's not. But um, no, there's several native. There's uh, the black haw viburnum um which it kind of has like a cherry like leaf and and some and, and the berries um there's um the native the dentatum um which I'm, I'm blanking on the name and uh there is also um uh, I'm, I'm blank on that but there's several They're viburnum totally species yeah i know <laughs> no it's fine there's several viburnum species that are nice there's um, sweet pepper bush. There's um, bayberry. Uh, there's native blueberry. So you know, um, I have I have two young kids, and so like if you plant native blueberries or or blackberries, you know, have something delicious in the summer that you That's can kind true. of pick at. And, and they and, are so good, fresh yeah, off the vine. They are really yeah. great. Um, yeah, and there's native roses uh, in this area. I mean, there, there's plenty to choose from. It, it's 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 just a, an, um, getting getting uh, those things out there and letting people know that they're they're available. Most I, I actually worked at a greenhouse. Uh, bef that's probably why I'm into plants. Um, before I got into what I did, and uh, for about seven years, and and a lot of what's carried in um, greenhouses is, is non-native, but there, is, there has been a push, I would say, within the past 10 years of some uh, greenhouses to carry more native species. So. Do you think it's a push by the scientists to help educate greenhouses more, or is like the greenhouse uh, operators trying to just be more educated in what they're doing? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of um, both. I think um, some greenhouse operators are really conscious and they want to you know they realize their role and the and to play and they try to do it. and then some of it's the outside literature and and public outreach it's not just writing and publishing a paper it's actually going and talking to people that on the ground that do that stuff yeah. and yeah so. yeah I, I couldn't agree more i mean heck i do all this i come all the yeah. time and so like I, I i'll be the first one to say yes while you know publishing your journal articles is very important yeah. you have to take it beyond that to be sure. able to reach out to the public and you know those 
even you know scientists not necessarily in your field because sometimes we don't always understand those particular journal articles because they're so focused that particular area so you mm -hmm. need someone to help explain it to you in a different way much sure. less if you're not even in science at all and you're you know you might be interested in things you still need someone to be able to digest it to you so that way you understand it because i know that there's things that even are in wildlife ecology that i'm a wildlife ecologist and i don't understand it and yeah. i need someone to like please break it down to me so we had a question that came in asking sure. what are some of the most uh, damaging invasives uh, in this particular area oh so. yeah that actually is an easy question um <laughs> Uh, so, um, barberry, um, Jap Japanese barberry, a lot of, um, of our invasives come from Asia and, and some from Europe as well. Um, uh, so Japanese barberry is one there and it's spiny and nasty. Um, uh, multiflora rose is another, um, those are both shrubs. Um, there's, uh, uh, Japanese honeysuckle, uh, bush honeysuckle to shrub. There's, um, oh gosh. Um, Do you guys have uh, Phragmites around there's here? There's Phragmites. That's, that's oh, yeah, a Phragmites big issue is, in the Great Lakes area where I'm from. Phragmites, so. uh, Japanese knotweed. You'll notice yep. a Japanese trend here. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't actually happen that all of them are from Japan, but some have. Um, and um, I mean, the, the list goes on and on. There, there's actually quite a ton, but those are those are the major ones that have been here for a while, and there's some newer ones like the ones I'm studying that are just starting to appear on the scene and spread. Uh, Photinia is is an uh, example of one that's just starting to spread, um, stuff like that. So. Yeah, do you think like because you were saying how some of these shrubs have been around for so long, but now are just becoming invasive? Like, what all of a sudden like would key that invasion? Is it just that they're maybe different species that are coming in that might be eating them so maybe different bird species that are taking advantage of it now are kicking off that invasion or maybe some other like factor that could be like all of a sudden like oh that's the trigger that causes this plant to now become invasive yeah well i mean like i was saying before um the biggest um the biggest uh thing that allows plants to spread is um habitat uh disturbance so whether that's um clearing the land for a house or or a park or um, you know, especially in this area, there was a lot of industry, and so when that industry goes defunct and starts to crumble and things start to grow up, uh, that's just tons of resources that these plants can take advantage of. Um, and so that's that's what kind of leads a lot of these plants to spread. In my case, um, with mine, because like you said, the berry, it's, I think from what my research is telling me and what I'm, I'm right in the phase of analyzing my data is that for, for my specific plan, it happens to be that um, one berry is just nutri more nutritious than other. So imagine you go into a candy shop, right? Mm -hmm. And you have a lot of, you know, you have chocolates and jelly beans and, and lollipops. Well, out of all that junk food, because um, the forests I work in are highly invaded, uh, you know, the, they're all down here, and then the, the one invasive that happens to be a little more nutritious, the birds are, are eating and spreading. Okay. So you have to offer something, you know, to, in order to get spread a lot of times, unless you're wind dispersed or, you know, fire like out west or something that, you know. Um, so in my case, it happens just to be, uh, I think, the, nu the nutritional content of the berry. Okay. Yeah. And do you think that because those areas are getting disturbed that the – native plants aren't able to keep up with that disturbance as well as the invasives and maybe they're able to take advantage of that and thus you know the birds are saying oh there's more of this and now we like it and we're learning do you think they're maybe not necessarily like learning but maybe you know becoming more accustomed to like oh that's the plant we want to eat now yeah i mean sometimes there's just no other options especially i mean um the biggest thing about invasives is uh, they decrease biodiversity um right they're right behind you know um habitat like loss like invasives yeah, like displace loss invasives and, yeah, yeah yeah invasives displace um natives a lot of times mm -hmm. so yeah some of it's that like if if you go back to that analogy with the candy shop like you don't have a lot of great options so you're going to mm -hmm. choose the one that's the best out of all the poor options right that's what you do as an individual hopefully you know and and that's what and my research the birds are doing it's seemingly that you know because um in the fall when everything's going to fruit and like some of the ones I mentioned like uh, barberry, honeysuckle and the viburnum species and, and um, the multiflora rose, they're all producing berries. There's like, it's a sea of red berries, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the birds are no dummies. They know, 
you know, they learn, uh, presumably, seemingly, um, what's good for them. So out of all the, all, the one, all the choices that they have, if there's no natives around, they're going to choose the best out of the worst, right? Yep. <laughs> so we just had someone uh, give a shout out from uh, Russia. So hello back to Russia. Hello. And I know we had someone uh, tuning in from Canada because I recognize their uh, handle name. So hello to Canada <laughs> as well. So uh, yeah, it's great to be able to see all of these people from all over the world yeah, being able to engage with them. So great. if you have any questions uh, about, oh, we've got a question. I was just going to say, so what is the best way to remove invasives and not have them return? So that's a good one because yeah, yeah a lot of times so you think, you know, do you burn it, but maybe it comes back? Do you have to fully remove it? Can you just cut it? Like, how do you deal with your particular invasive species? Well, for mine, um, usually, so there's a whole host of um, pest, or, uh, yeah, pesticides out there, herbicides more specifically, that will treat it. Um, I mean, the best way uh, for most times is, is to, you can cut it um, and then treat the stump. Uh, with a herbicide and that will kill the roots and hopefully it doesn't grow back up. I mean, the best way is persistence though, because sometimes, you know, you'll do that and you'll have to check in a year. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's for woody stuff. I mean, for, for herbaceous stuff, it might be tougher. You, you can do a, a, what they call a foliar spray, which is just spraying the leaves. Um, and you spray the leaves and hopefully it, it knocks it back. And sometimes uh, they have these things where you can inject into the tree okay. uh, and, and, the, and it will go down and it will just totally take it out. But with any of these things, it's um, persistence um, because plants have a whole host of ways to stay alive. And um, like the plant I'm working with can simply put down a branch into soil and then shoot break up. off and oh, shoot up. That's troublesome. <laughs> and there's fruit, of course. I mean, fruit's the primary way. So like even if you kill the shrub with the fruits remaining, if that fruit falls off. So any mm -hmm. anytime you're handling anything that's invasive, you want to kill it before it bears fruit. Uh, and then uh, go back in six months or three months, it depends on where you live, of course, in your growing season, um, and check it to make sure, and then check the following year to make sure. And then after that, usually you're you're safe. But some stuff right. is really persistent. So Okay. Yeah, and then you have, like, the additional problem, too, with the fruit. If the birds are eating it, like, where are they transporting it to and trying to find where that new, yeah. you know, invasion has started? And... Yeah, it's, 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 it's an impossible task sometimes, seemingly. But there's a lot of motivated people out there, uh, not just that are employed by by parks, but, but a, a whole host of volunteers that, that really want to keep things native, which is, which is really nice. So. All right. Yeah, so speaking of like that bird component, uh, how do you study to see what birds are eating it and then where they're going? Like, Yeah, so my research only addresses what birds are eating it. Okay. Um, we could have uh, done mist netting to capture birds and see what birds are in the community, and we could have um, studied their, their feces and see what, what they're pooping out. Hashtag science poop, everyone. Yeah. It's the best hashtag out there. Exactly. Or what they're regurgitating. <laughs> Um, but since I wasn't, uh, I'm more plant focused, I wanted to follow the plant story more and what okay. the barrier was doing. All we know, at least from my research right now, is that um, one, one shrub is most likely dispersed by migratory birds, so it could potentially go further and the other is not. Uh, there's more research that needs to be done. I mean, that's that's with any study, right? Uh, it's the first thing you learn as a scientist. Like, great, I, I got my answer. It's like oh, I have like a million more other questions. questions. Uh, yeah. Yes, exactly. So, I mean, there's there's a lot that needs to be done. And this is only one shrub. I'm using more as a test case because it's not widespread mm -hmm. and it makes an interesting model species to use. Um, but uh, I mean, there's so many different mechanisms of, of spread. I mean, you could spend a lifetime doing it. Yeah, that would be interesting, especially for the ornithologists out there, if they were to team with a, a botanist such as mm -hmm. yourself to be able to see, okay, what species are going by that particular habitat during where the berries are there mm -hmm. and then seeing, okay, where they migrate and then be able to like start surveying along those migration routes to see, okay, are we seeing yeah. new invasions of that particular shrub? Yeah, I, I think um, so too. I mean, that's why, I mean, uh, partnerships and collaborations are the best thing in science and, you know, you don't have to be uh, a jack of all trades, a master of none. I mean, the whole idea, right, beyond mm -hmm. getting peaches, being Best, highly specified, uh, you know, and so like I partnered with my um, la my lab mate uh, Kathleen, and she did she helped me out with all the bird stuff, and it's great, you know. I, it's always wonderful when that can happen, and 
and you know the more you work with people and and their specialties and take advantage of that the more prolific you can be as a scientist so. yeah I, I can't agree more because there's so much out there and it's it's hard enough just to become an expert in your one particular area much less when you start adding in all these different factors that yes while they do help you answer that question it's just it's so hard i mean you would be at it for 50 years and yeah. still not know everything you need to know and that's why science communication is important and getting your message <laughs> out and talk hopefully talking to other other people and and, and scientists you know yeah because um, i mean you never know there could be an ornithologist out there that's watching that like sure. oh i study migrants i go through the yes. east coast and that's a something i can go look for to see if there's shrubs that's along right. the way i'll and... be at esa in portland yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. awesome Great plug. Uh, well, yeah. I see we're running out of time okay. here. So if you have any other questions, uh, feel free uh, to tweet us. Uh, I'll make sure I get those questions uh, sent off to Anthony and we'll get uh, the answers uh, for those questions. In the meantime, uh, just to let you all know, uh, follow along with the uh, at SciComm uh, handle for because we'll be uh, doing more uh, talks later today. I believe our next one is with uh, Rebecca Panko. Um, and we'll be discussing her work. Uh, follow along with the hashtag for Rutgers, NJIT, SciComm. Everything I'm doing on this trip is underneath that particular hashtag. And then if you want to uh, get a hold of me personally, uh, you can tweet me at Wildlife Biogal. So either one of those handles will work for uh, getting a hold of us uh, for uh, further questions. So thank you so much yeah, for being on. This was you. great. I oh, love my good. invasive species uh, yeah. stuff. So I'm always game for that. Yeah, was, no, thank you for having me on. It's so. been a pleasure. And then for everyone out there, if you're in your gardens uh, planning, make sure you plant native. Double check what it is you're planting and That's help right. out that local community because you never know. You might get a really cool bird that shows up in your backyard there if you, you plant go. native. So, yeah. all right, we'll see you guys in a little bit because I believe we're broadcasting at 11 o'clock with Rebecca. So we'll see you all shortly. Thank you.